Hello and welcome to the lecture on semantic segmentation. So today we move from bounding box representations to pixel-wise representations. So let's see what semantic segmentation actually means. So we have been working a lot with neural networks that take an image and uh, give as output a classification of the main object in the image. For example, and you can see here it, at the top, we have this image of the cat. We pass it through a neural network, which is trained to identify objects in the image. And then this neural network gives us back the label cat. Now, if you want to take it one step further, we can do uh, what we have seen in the past few lectures, which is we can put a bounding box around the actual object around the cat. But now we want to go into an even more precise domain. We actually want to take the full image and we want to assign a label to each pixel of the image. So we don't want to say only there is a cat in the image or look, there is a cat within this bounding box. But we actually want to say which pixels of the image actually depict the cat. So in this case, for example, we would have the yellow pixels that depict the cat, we would have green pixels that depict the grass, then we would have trees, we would have sky. So essentially, our neural network, we want to train a neural network that is actually able to give us not only um, a general label for the whole image, not only a bounding box for the objects, but actually a classification, a semantic meaning for each of the pixels in the image. So this is essentially the task of semantic segmentation. So actually every pixel in the image needs to be labeled with a category label. And by this we actually mean semantic classes like cat, trees, cow or sky. And note how we actually do not differentiate between the instances. So for example here in the second image we have two cows and the label for all the pixels in both cows is actually the label cow. So there is actually the same label for both instances um, of cows. So in semantic segmentation, we do not differentiate between pixels coming from different cows. When we go in the next lecture towards instant segmentation, then we're going to make this distinction between the different instances of the cow. So it is very common actually to use uh, what is called fully convolutional networks for the task of semantic segmentation. So fully convolutional networks um, are essentially networks that are able to deal with any input or output size. And the idea here is that if you use only convolutional operations, then you can actually change the size of your input image and your convolution is always going to be able to give you an output. So this is unlike fully connected layers that need to have a very precise input size. Of course, when we talk about any input or output size, there's always a limitation, especially in the, in the lower end. So essentially you cannot make the image arbitrarily small because at some point your convolutions and poolings are going to reduce the size of your feature map so much that you will end up essentially with no spatial resolution. So of course when we say any input or output size we actually mean that if you have an image which is 24 by 24 and can be processed by your convolutional neural network when you actually make it 48 by 48 essentially what is happening is you're doubling the size, the spatial size of your feature maps, but your convolutions can still act on this 48 by 48 image. So essentially, in order to take a normal image classification neural network, like for example, the one that is depicted here, which typically consists in a series of convolutional layers and then a series of fully connected layers that actually map the feature maps towards the classes um, that we actually want to classify the image for. Typically what we do in order to convert these neural networks into fully convolutional neural networks is that we replace the fully connected layers with convolutional layers. And once we have done this we know that we can actually take as input any image size 
And the last thing that we need to do in order to convert this network, which was previously doing image classification, into a network that can actually output a segmentation map, therefore an output, a segmentation label for each pixel. The only thing that we need to do is to convert the output of the last layer to the original resolution. So essentially here we did some convolutions and poolings, we have some final convolutional layers which are these fully um, connected layers which we have converted into convolutional layers. And now the only thing that we need to do is to convert this small spatial resolution that we have here in our feature map into the original resolution. Now in order to train this network what we do then is we do essentially softmax cross entropy between the pixel-wise predictions and the segmentation ground truth. So we have a loss per pixel that indicates whether the class that was predicted for this pixel is correct or not. And then we backpropagate and we train our neural network. So this is kind of the standard way, the easy way to take an image classification neural network and convert it into a fully convolutional neural network that can output actually a semantic map. So the question is, how do we exactly do this com what is called convolutionalization? So essentially taking these fully connected layers and converting them into equivalent convolutions. So essentially this is done by converting fully connected layers into one by one convolutions. And if you have taken the I2DL lecture, you will have already seen what one by one convolutions are. So here there's a small recap. So this is essentially how um, convolutions act on images, right? We have our image, in this case five by five, we have our kernel, and essentially in order to create one value of the output feature map, what we do is we take our kernel and we place it in one position of the image. And then we just multiply the kernel values by the image values, sum up the result, and we get the output. So this is a convolution with a 3x3 kernel. Same thing happens when we have a 1x1 one one kernel. In this case, this is just one number. And so what we're going to do is we're going to slide this kernel through all the positions of the image, and we're going to get an output. And in this case, of course, if we have an image of 5x5, five five, and if you have a kernel of 1x1, one one, you can already imagine what is going to be the output size. So the output size is going to be also a 5x5 five five image. And this is essentially because uh, we don't actually need, uh, we don't actually have this operation of taking, for example, these nine values of the 3x3 three three kernels and condensing them to one, which effectively means that we're losing um, these two values of the size of the 5x5 five five image which shrinks our output to 3x3, three three, unless we use padding, of course. So in this case, there is none of that, we just have one value which we are sliding throughout our image and recreating this output image. So essentially what we have done here is we have taken the input image and we have multiplied all the image by two. So we have essentially scaled our image uh, and multiplied by the weight of our one by one kernel. So the important thing about one by one convolutions is that they keep the dimensions of the input in the output. And essentially the only operation that we're doing is we're scaling the input. So now you might wonder, well, th this is not really an interesting operation, right? I mean, why do we actually need one by one convolutions? Now, the interesting thing is that if we have this feature map, let's say we have a spatial resolution 32 by 32, the depth is three, and um, now we want to apply a one by one convolution. So how one by one convolution works is essentially we're not changing the spatial resolution, but we're actually acting as any convolution, we're acting on the whole depth, right? So we not only have one weight of our one by one kernel, but in this case, the depth is three. So we actually have these uh, three weights in our one by one convolution. And from these three weights, we're actually going to, um, to multiply these three values of the image by the three weights, and we're going to create one output. So this is essentially 
equivalent as having a three neuron fully connected layer that is acting on one pixel of our 32 by 32 feature map. So you can already see here um, how we can actually use one by one convolutions. So if one filter of one by one by three actually converts uh, these three pixels of our feature map into one value, when we actually apply five filters, we get five values for that particular spatial position of our feature map. So essentially, if we use one filter, which is a one by one convolution, we will get as output 32 by 32 by one. So the depth will be one. If we use five filters, the depth will be five. So you can immediately see one application of one by one convolutions, which is actually changing the depth of our feature map. And um, this is often called actually um, a network in network representation and is used actually in uh, the inception network, which is um, one famous um, type of architecture, which we have actually discussed in introduction to deep learning. So again, um, one by one convolutions are very useful to shrink this number, the number of channels. If, for example, you're performing a series of convolution operations and suddenly you end up with this feature map, which is 32 by 32 by 200. So the depth is actually too large. And now you would like to do an operation on this feature map, but actually computationally, it's too expensive to do this operation on the original size of the feature map. So what you can do is you can say, well, I would like to shrink the size, but keep the spatial resolution. So how I do this is essentially I apply a 32, uh, I apply 32 filters, one by one by 200 filters, convolutional filters, plus of course my nonlinearity. And suddenly I have a feature map, which is 32 by 32 by 32. And now I can apply whatever operation I want on top of it. So note that this is not a trivial operation, right? Because we're still adding a nonlinearity. We're still adding this ReLU that we have after any convolution. So this operation, aside from shrinking the size um, of, the, of the depth, uh, shrinking the depth of my feature map, it also adds a nonlinearity. So one can actually learn more complex functions by adding one by one convolutions. So once we reach this point, right, we can we know that we can turn any image classification network into a fully convolutional network. We have our convolutional operations, we have our fully connected layers, which we know how to exchange for one by one convolutions. So we have seen actually that um, that this operation of the of the fully connected layers in the example where we have, for example, three neurons was exactly the same as having a one by one convolution uh, which acts on, on this depth of three of my input map. So now I can convert my um, image classification network into a fully convolutional network. The only thing I then do is I take this upsampling operation. So I take this uh, input feature map, which now has a small spatial resolution. So you see here that my spatial resolution has been shrinked down by all these convolution and polling operations. And now I have to just blow it up to my original output size. And the question is actually, how, how do I do this, right? So if I just take this, this output, which has a small uh, spatial resolution, and I just upsample it, then I will have very coarse results. So how do I do proper upsampling? So what the authors of the FCN paper actually proposed to do is to predict masks from different levels of the convolutional neural network. So we see here uh, a depiction of this architecture, right? So we start from our input image with a series of convolution pooling, convolution pooling, and you see how um, the spatial resolution is being reduced. So here we have the high spatial resolution of the image, and the resolution is reduced as we do the convolution and pooling operation. And in the end, we reach this um, size in which we have essentially one output pixel, one output of our feature map, which represents 
an area or a patch in the input image. And so essentially what, uh, what it, the, the crude up sample would do is it would just do this uh, prediction by essentially saying, well, any prediction that we have in here, we just upsample it and essentially have this uh, 32 times that sampling, which of course gives you these coarse results, right? So now what they propose to do is, okay, what if we go one step before, right? We go to the previous layer for which the spatial resolution is a bit higher. And so we can also predict a semantic segmentation mask from these mid-level features. And with those features, we just need to do an upsampling of 16 times. Now, of course, we can do the same. We can go um, all the way back, also predict segmentation from uh, the third uh, pooling layer. And in this case, I only need to upsample eight times. So now, of course, what I'm going to have here at the, at the last layer is these high-level features, right? So there's a lot of representational power that has been put into these last layers. Um, so there is a lot of high-level features that can actually help me predict the mask correctly. And as I go uh, further and further back into the network, I have my mid-level features here and my low-level features here. So I'm going to have less global information from the whole image. So I might, you know, miss a little bit uh, the Samani categories there, but I'm going to have more resolution. So probably a combination of the three outputs is what is going to give me the best results. So essentially what they propose here is to do what they call hierarchical training. So the network is initially trained only on the high level features and there's the loss only on this output here. And then the network is slowly fine tuned based on the middle features first and the low level features afterwards. So there's a strong prior of information from pre-training on the high level features and then the fine tuning actually essentially refines the semantic mask and brings a little bit of resolution to the output. So you can see um, why this is important, right? I mean, we need to learn high-level features, but the network also needs to learn middle, mid and low-level details of the image to kind of bring this, this detail in the segmentation mask, right? We're not only interested in knowing at a high level there is a cut, there is grass, but we're also interested in knowing it at a detail, you know, at a higher level of detail, where is the edge of this cut, where is the edge of the graph. And for this we need both the high level features as well as the mid and low level features. So you see here some of the qualitative results when we actually use only the last, um, so this high level feature training, that we have good categories, so the categories are correct, right? There's a bicycle, there's a person, but there is no detail. The, the, the masks are very coarse. Now, as we add the mid-level feature training and the low-level feature training, the high-level categories are kept, but the boundaries are actually much, much more accurate. And um, after this uh, FCN, which you can see here on the left, what are the results when uh, we go all the way to um, just eight times upsampling? Um, so there is actually, um, these results are actually really good, especially when compared to, for example, SDS, which is an RCNN-based method. So it actually uses object proposals. And in general, you can see that FCN outperforms uh, significantly SDS. And it, it was especially important because it really outperformed pre-deep learning methods. Um, so it's kind of the baseline method for semantic segmentation, right? So like AlexNet was for, for image classification, essentially, we can consider FCN as being a sort of this, of this baseline for semantic segmentation, from where a lot of works actually um, act were actually inspired from. But it turns out that we can do, we can do even better. Right, so we can do even more precise upsampling, and we can actually do it if we use um, architect specific architectures 
which are called um, unit architectures, autoencoders, style architectures. So they have actually a lot of names. And these are essentially architectures that learn not only to do the downsampling, so this, um, this typical operation that we have been doing in neural networks, which is essentially the convolution pooling operation that kind of gathers all this uh, semantic information of the image, right? It not only does that, but it also has a phase in which it slowly converts all this information all the way back into the input uh, dimension. So essentially you start from the input image and you end up with exactly the same dimension in the output, spatial dimension in the output. So for this we're going to go over uh, this autoencoder style of architectures. So you see here a depiction of this architecture. You have your convolutions and pooling operations that reduces the image size until you reach the bottleneck representation. And after this, what you would essentially have is a series of upsampling layers plus a series of convolutions after it. So what you would do is upsample your representation, then correct it with a series of convolutions, upsample, correct, upsample, correct, until you would reach the end where you would have simply a softmax for each pixel that would give you the output semantic segmentation. So this was the convolutional encoder-decoder architecture that was proposed in SECnet in 2016. Now, as I said, SECnet is composed of two parts, the encoder, which has these normal convolutional filters plus pooling that reduce the spatial size, and the decoder. And the decoder is exactly the opposite. It's the upsampling plus convolutional filters. Now, it's important to note that the decoder part has not only the upsampling, but also these convolutional filters after it. And essentially, the intuition here is that we're going to do a rough upsampling of our feature map, and then we're going to have a chance to correct it through a series of convolutional layers. And these convolutional layers are trained, like um, the convolutional layers of the encoder, using backpropagation. So these are regular convolutional filters. And again, the goal of these convolutional filters is to train them so that they actually refine the upsampling that we did. Now recall the notion of transpose convolution that we also saw. And this was exactly this idea, right? So you wanted to go from an input of three by three, which is depicted here by the blue samples at the bottom, all the way to an output of five by five. And how you would actually do it is you would first perform unpooling of the input. So you see how you're actually spreading the samples of this three by three input that you have here. And then what you would do is you would take this convolutional filter and you would slide it on top of this spread it out unpooled input in order to produce the 5 by 5 output. Now, all of this operation, unpooling plus convolutional filter, that is also learned with backpropagation, is called the transpose convolution. So another question is, can we do better our upsampling than just you know, unpooling and just spreading around your samples? Well, it turns out that with unpooling, what you do is exactly this operation here. You spread your green samples all across a broader feature map, but you leave all the other values, all the other white squares actually empty. You basically put a zero there if you're doing unpooling. Now, there are other ways of actually dealing with these empty spaces. And the question essentially boils down to what kind of value am I going to put on these empty spaces? And one solution is actually interpolation. There are several ways of interpolating an image. For example, if you want to interpolate this tiny image 10 times, you can use nearest neighbor interpolation, which is essentially for each pixel that is empty, you look at the nearest neighbor, the nearest neighbor in space, and you simply copy its value. Now, of course, this creates these, these kind of blocks uh, from just taking the values from the nearest neighbors. You can do a little bit better if you do bilinear interpolation, which actually means not only taking the value of the nearest neighbors, but looking at all the neighbors around you and then 
doing a weighted sum of their values. Or you can even go ahead and do bicubic interpolation. In any case, for any of these interpolations, you're going to have a better estimate of what kind of output do you want to have at this resolution compared to just doing unpooling, where all the values in the middle are actually zero. So this, of course, um, has more of a soft output than just doing unpooling. So you're going to tend to have fewer artifacts in your output. Now, the other way of doing this um, is actually what we saw, doing fixed unpooling plus putting a series of convolutions on top. And at first, one thought that interpolation was a better way to go. But in 2017, they showed that if you have enough data, actually, all you need to do is do a transpose convolution, fixed unpooling plus a series of convolutional layers on top. It's also very efficient because you don't have to compute any interpolated values for the white squares. And there is a third way, uh, which is actually unpooling a la deconf net. So if you remember what the deconf net did to actually perform the unpooling, remember that it kept the locations where the maximum came from from the, um, from the pooling operation. So once we do the max pool operation, we have these four maximums, which are going to be passed to the next level, to the pooled map. And these four locations are the ones that are going to be saved here in these max location switches and are going to be used later for the unpooling operation to actually know where to place your values. And the rest of the map is kept at zero. So this is also something that you can do, right? You can actually do the pooling operation, save the locations, and do the unpooling by keeping the locations where the maximum came from. Now, remember that in the deconfnet, we were convolving with a transpose of the learned filter. So the full deconfnet architecture is completely different with what we're proposing here, in which we're actually learning the convolutional filter. So it's very important to differentiate between the full deconfnet architecture and just doing the deconfnet type of unpooling. So as we said already in the deconfnet, um, this type of unpooling was helping to keep the details of the structures, to keep actually the edges in the right position, in the original position. So this is going to be exactly the same as what's going to happen when we use it inside autoencoders to perform the unpooling. Now, there is another element in autoencoders that is very, very crucial to get good results, good pixel-wise predictions, and these are skip connections. So skip connections um, are part of what is called the UNET architecture, which was proposed in 2015 for medical applications. And what this architecture is, is essentially an encoder-decoder architecture. So you see it here depicted in a slightly different way, where you have all the encoder on the left side, you reach the bottleneck layer, and then you have the decoder on the right side. So hence the name UNET. And now this encoder, again, is a series of convolution plus pooling operations. The decoder is up convolution, transpose convolution operations. But there is an element that is interesting, and these are these gray arrows here in the middle. These are essentially representing skip connections. So the idea here is that you want to have all kinds of high-level information that is being decoded in the decoder. And this comes essentially from the bottleneck layer. So what is happening effectively in the encoder is you're getting your spatial resolution down to a really, really small representation. But you're actually compressing all the information. You're really understanding the whole image and putting all this information in the depth channels. So there is really a lot of high-level information compressing the bottleneck layer. When you go up and up through the decoder, what you're doing is you're trying to create more and more detail. 
And even though the high-level information that is coming from the bottleneck layer is really important, you also need low-level information. You need to know where the edges are located because you need to know where to put, for example, the end of your mask in the case of uh, a semantic segmentation output. You need to know exactly where the cat ends and where the dog begins. And for this, you need low-level information. And if high-level information is encoded in the bottleneck, low-level information tends to be lost as we do convolutions and poolings, right? That, that is the whole idea of doing convolutions and poolings. And so what the skip connection does is essentially it combines the high-level information that is coming from the bottleneck layer with the low-level information that is coming from the initial layers that still maintain a high spatial resolution. And essentially what we do is we combine them. We concatenate both feature maps, the low-level information feature map and the high-level information feature map. And we do a series of convolutions to process both informations together. So recall the idea of ResNet, right? This has a similar intuition, right? You want to have some of these residual connections that allow you to send information directly and not have to go through all the network. And you can do several things. Um, th there are several ways of combining this low-level information in the side of information. In this case, what we do is basically concatenation, what here they call copy and crop. And what they call it crop is actually because the two dimensions of the encoder and the decoder do not match each other. And so they have to do a little bit of cropping there. So usually what you would have is exactly the same spatial dimension in the encoder and the same spatial dimension in the same level of the decoder. So we can look at a, at a zoomed in version where we can see here the bottleneck layer and actually one of these skip connections, how we actually combine this low level information with the high level information that has gone all the way down um, through the bottleneck layer. So what here, what happens here is simply we're concatenating these two feature maps, which means that the spatial dimension remains and the depth is the only thing that is larger. Now, since we're going to apply a convolution on top of these concatenated feature maps, we can use this first convolution to reduce again the representation from 512 in this case, which is double the size, the two feature maps together, all the way to 256, which is the depth that we want to have in this case for this architecture. So you have here 256 channels, 256 channels put together, and then a convolution reduces it again to 256. So uh, skip connections um, are used actually in many architectures. For example, for depth prediction, having skip connections is extremely important to get the details, to really get this, um, these edges where the object ends and therefore the depth changes with respect to the background. And you can put these skip connections in several layers. So here, for example, um, three types of skip connections in three different levels are depicted. And um, the three different levels are different types of low-level information. So, of course, the lower you go, so CC1, for example, is going to have more low-level, um, really going to look at edges type of information than if you go, for example, to CC3. So skip connections are pretty much everywhere when you use this encoder-decoder type of architecture. If you want to get an output that is really pixel-wise precise, you need these skip connections. But at what level these skip connections are needed actually depends on your problem. So this is a bit of a trial and error. So we take a look now at one of the most famous and well-performing architectures in semantic segmentation, and that is DeepLab. So what DeepLab actually does is it takes an input image, it processes, uh, it, processes it through a deep convolutional neural network to get a coarse map of the semantic classes that are in there. And then what it proposes to do, it actually, it proposes to refine this map 
with a fully connected um, conditional random field. And this is essentially what brings this coarse score map into a pixel-wise precise semantic map. Now, DeepLab has roughly three ingredients to tackle three of the main challenges of semantic segmentation. And these are the three ingredients that uh, we will go through in detail today. So the first one is actually um, the challenge of a reduced feature resolution. So we have seen what is the solution of the FCN architecture to solve that. In here, DeepLab proposes to use what is called atrus convolutions. Now, the second challenge is that objects exist at multiple scales. So you cannot use a single convolutional neural network and you cannot make predictions at the same scale for objects which occupy half of the image and objects which occupy just a few pixels. So for this, um, DeepLab actually proposes to use pyramid pooling, which is something that is used also in detection. And um, the third challenge is actually the challenge of the poor localization of the edges. So actually, these semantic outputs do not have really a lot of resolution in the edges. And in order to solve this, um, DeepLab actually proposes to do this refinement of, this, of the core semantic map with a conditional random field, which actually takes information and brings information to all the pixels in the image. So let's start by looking at the first proposed solution. So how can atrius convolutions uh, help with the reduction of the feature resolution that we experience when we use convolutional neural networks and especially pooling operations? So essentially what we would like to have is we would like to have an operation where there is no need to actually reduce the feature uh, spatial resolution. So let's imagine that we have um, this image as input. So we have our spatial resolution width and height. We have our depth in RGB, so three channels. And then um, let's imagine that we could apply a fully convolutional network that consisted only in convolution and not linear activation. So essentially convolution and ReLU. Now, if these convolutions were same convolutions, meaning with padding we could actually uh, maintain the spatial resolution, after a series of convolutions, theoretically, we could get an image with the same spatial resolution, but now with the depth representing the semantic classes instead of just the RGB pixels. Now, of course, this would be a super expensive operation, right? Think about all the convolutional operations that are acting always on this, on this uh, input spatial size and think about actually how to create a convolutional operation that acts or that has a receptive field that acts on the whole image, right? I mean, this would be absolutely impossible. This would be absolutely expensive. So essentially, one alternative is to use what is called dilated convolutions. So essentially, in the normal convolution, we have this operation of first unsampling, then applying the convolution, and then upsampling. Right? This is the classic architecture that we have seen in, in the autoencoder style of architecture, this downsampling and upsampling operation at the encoder and then at the decoder. And essentially what happens if we do this downsampling outsampling operation is we have kind of a sparse feature extraction from the standard convolution that is being applied on this low resolution input feature map. So we see here when we apply this uh, convolutional kernel, this colored convolutional kernel on the original image, we have all of these activations. And as soon as we upsample, of course, these activations kind of spread out. And it is as though we have a sparse feature extraction operation. Now, what we would ideally like to have is we would like to have an operation that actually allows us to perform dense feature extraction. And we can do this with atrius convolutions, with dilated convolutions, with what is called a rate of two. And uh, a rate of two, what essentially means is that we actually have this kernel, which only contains values which are kind of spread out. So 
The kernel is not dense, it does not contain values in all the positions, but it is the kernel that is actually sparse. And this kernel is applied on top of all the image, and this is actually what allows us to have a dense feature extraction without increasing the computational, um, the, the expensiveness of the operation too much. So let's see in more detail what do we mean by this by these um, dilated convolutions. So here we have a depiction of what a dilated convolution means in one dimension. So we have here at the top a depiction of a normal convolution, which would mean sparse feature extraction. So essentially this would mean applying a standard convolution on a low resolution input feature map. So here you would have the original resolution, here you would have the downscaled resolution, which is actually your input. And then you apply a normal convolution on top, right? So a normal convolution, which has actually kernel 3, so it takes these three values and it converts them to one value in the, in the output feature map. So essentially, first we apply this, um, this low resolution conversion, so we basically downscale our input, and then we apply the standard convolution on top of the low resolution input map. So this is the classic way of doing sparse feature extraction. Now for dilated convolutions, they do what they call the dense feature extraction, which essentially means that I'm going to apply a convolution but the convolution is not going to act on all the elements of the input space. So here we have a dilated convolution with rate R2, which essentially means that it actually takes three pixels also. So note that the kernel is still three, but instead of taking three consecutive pixels, it takes three pixels which are basically two pixels apart. This is why the rate is actually two. So essentially you have exactly the same kernel, right? It takes the same input size, it still takes three pixels. But now this kernel is acting on the original resolution. And therefore when you apply this operation you have that you take this original resolution and you convert it to these five inputs here. Now of course this pixel has not seen these three consecutive values of the input feature map, it has seen values which are spread out. And this actually allows you to do a reduction of um, the, the output feature map without reducing the input resolution. So essentially what, um, what is happening here is as though you had a standard convolution and you just dilated this convolution. So you take this, these nine values. Now this is a 2D depiction of the dilated convolution, right? And you still have this 3x3 three three kernel, right? So the number of parameters has not really changed. You have just taken these nine values and you have spread them out, right? So if you have a dilation of two, this is the filter that you can observe here where essentially the values of your kernel are spread out. And so a standard convolution would have a dilation of 1, a dilated convolution could have, for example, a dilation of 2. And you can imagine a dilated convolution as being essentially a convolution filter with holes in the middle. So here we have essentially a kernel that is occupying, or let's say it's spread it out through a surface that is actually 5 by 5. But there are a lot of values in the middle that are not being used. Only nine values are being used in this five by five input space that the, that the kernel is actually spreading to. And so, of course, what happens in dilated convolutions is that you're actually changing the receptive field, right? So here we have um, the exact same number of parameters, right? We have a 3x3 three three kernel, so 9 parameters here, dilated convolution still with 9 parameters, and an even higher dilate, dilation with still 9 parameters. So essentially we haven't changed the number of parameters, right? So the number of computations is still exactly the same. But in the first case we have 
a standard convolution, dilation rate is actually one, and you have a receptive field of three by three, right? So you take this three by three patch and you convert it into one output with this convolution operation. Now, if the dilation parameter is two, here we have the depiction in the middle, then each element in the output actually has a receptive field of seven by seven. Doesn't mean that you use all the pixels in the seven by seven patch, but your receptive field is still, in fact, seven by seven. And when the dilation parameter is four, and each element that is produced by it actually has a receptive field of 15 by 15. So essentially, each of these operations, right, each of these layers has exactly the same number of parameters, right? We still have these nine weights in our kernel, but the receptive field is actually growing. So we can grow the receptive field exponentially with dilated convolutions while the number of parameters just grows linearly. So we're going to jump directly now into the third challenge, that is the poor localization of the edges. So we have seen already in detection a bit of an idea of what the pyramid processing is. So we're going to look into the refinement with conditional random fields. So conditional random fields were very much used, for example, for um, interactive segmentation. So essentially, where you want to segment an image in the foreground and background, and you want some user input. So in this case, the user uh, would provide some scribbles on the background and some scribbles on the foreground. So essentially, what um, how you treat these scribbles is as, as ground truth, right? So these are essentially annotations. So you're sure that these pixels actually belong to the background and these pixels belong to the foreground. So essentially what you do with a conditional random field is um, that you create this optimization problem, right? And this optimization problem is essentially about labeling pixels in the image. So you want to obtain this binary label. You want to obtain this label of foreground and background. And you have several terms that you actually have to analyze. So first you have unary terms, which are pixel-wise terms, which basically tell you what is the penalty that you have to pay if you don't respect the annotations, right? So for these pixels that the user has labeled for sure as background, what happens if I actually give the label foreground? Then I have to pay essentially a penalty. And then you have the pairwise terms. Pairwise terms are looking at neighboring pixels and they basically want to encourage a smooth label, right? So you don't want to have some pixel here as foreground, then some neighboring pixels, background, foreground, background, foreground, background, no, right? You actually assume that um, the annotations are smooth that the output is smooth, that the objects are self-contained, and therefore all the foreground pixels should be relatively closer together and all the background pixels should be relatively closer together. So by defining this unary term and pairwise term, however you want, you can put uh, different types of information in there. Then you create this optimization problem and by solving this optimization problem, you give this, uh, these labels to the pixels, whether they are foreground or background. So there is no deep learning in there yet. So if you're interested in the actual formulation of the conditional random field, I recommend that you read um, this original paper. So essentially, by putting this optimization on top of our neural network output, um, deep light is actually, um, what actually it achieves is um, more precise semantic output, more precise um, semantic mask. And this is because this, um, this optimization problem kind of iterates the neural network output and makes sure that all the pixels agree with each other, that there is this smoothness assumption, and therefore it keeps correcting the solution, the output of the CNN, until it's, uh, it's more accurate, essentially. And so you can see here how this um, output evolves. So you have here the input image, the ground truth semantic map that you're trying to get to. We have the score map before the softmax function and the belief map, which is essentially the output of the softmax function. 
And then you see here the iterations that are performed with the conditional random field. So essentially here we do a refinement of the output, another refinement, another refinement, and you see that all these false positive here actually get corrected by the CRF. So essentially this gives us um, pretty good results, a lot of good refined results. So you can see here the refinement that happens. So here's the result before the CRF and here's the result after the CRF. So you can see some refinement for um, all of these categories. And you can see here, for example, the refinement of the legs of these, of these animals here, some false positives which actually disappear in the CRF output, so the errors are, for example, corrected. And so in general, what CRS um, gives you is this, um, this strong information of um, the image space, right? So what pixels are nearby, um, how should pixels agree with each other. Um, so this is something that CRS gives you and that actually allows you to improve results by quite a lot. So this is, for example, this is a good example where I have the CNN outputs quite noisy. With the CRF, all pixels agree with each other and then we have a smoother result in the output. So a lot of these false positives are actually erased. And so essentially we can use this architecture, we can use dblock to actually get quite accurate results in a lot of scenarios. Here we have, for example, output also in the, in the autonomous driving scenario. Um, so of course we still have some uh, false positives, some errors, but results overall look actually really good. But of course there are several problems with having a CRF on top of a neural net. Right, So the network is still not trained end-to-end, -end, which is something that nowadays is pretty common to go directly from input to the output that you're interested in having and not having any of these optimizations in the middle. So in the original DBlock architecture, the SCN and the CRF are trained independently from each other. Therefore, you cannot really improve the neural network output with gradients coming from the CRF. And so first of all, um, this is suboptimal, right? You cannot really um, encourage both formulations to improve. And the training is also slow because you have to do this separate training. So one solution that researchers came up with is, okay, how if we formulate the CRF actually as a recurrent neural network? So we're going to try to um, mimic the operations of the CRF with a recurrent neural network, where we know exactly how to backpropagate. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to backpropagate first through the recurrent neural network and then to the fully connected, uh, fully convolutional, sorry, neural network. So essentially, this is what this paper, this ICSV 2015 proposed, right? So you want to have this um, still this separation of a fully convolutional neural network that gives you a rough score map and then a CRF type of architecture that refines this score map. And in this case, the CRF is actually um, a recurrent neural network. So it is implemented as a recurrent neural network. And we're not going to go into details into how this is implemented, but um, I do want to point out into what kind of improvements can we get when we actually use this powerful combination of SCN plus RNN simulating CRF and training everything together. So you can see here how um, we have improved by quite a lot here the, the segmentation of the bike. So in this case, the ground truth is even less precise than the actual segmentation that we get from this output. And we see at the same time it's able to correct a lot of errors with respect to the Dibla formulation. Uh, here we also have a class that was completely missed by uh, Dibla, and here we can actually capture it. So overall, training end-to-end -end is something that is really, really powerful. But now we get to the question, um, you know, do, do we actually need the CRF? Do we need this RNN to act as a CRF? 
right? So we did all this to actually properly localize edges, to properly localize masks. So essentially to get these contours of the mask correctly. Um, but if we actually want um, to, to get these, these contours correctly, then we need to process the information at the original image resolution, right? So in our case, the CRF was looking at the whole image, was looking at all the pixels. Otherwise, if you scale down the resolution, then this is something that is going to be impossible. So if you're going to look at the original image resolution, if you're going to look at all the pixels anyway, could we actually use uh, something else that is not um, a CRF or an RNN acting as a CRF? So could we actually use something that is called attention? So let's see what attention is. So attention was first introduced for machine translation. So the problem of translating one sentence into another. And here the main problem was that for very long sentences, the score, the accuracy score for machine translation, which is depicted here in the x-axis, actually really went down after 30 or 40 words. So the algorithm, which was based mostly on recurrent neural networks, was translating properly, but after 30 or 40 words, it essentially forgot what was said in the beginning, and so the accuracy started to go down. So there was this, this notion of performance degradation, which goes hand in hand with the idea that recurrent neural networks have a memory problem. So after a while, they forget the information that they have processed. And so what they proposed to do in order to solve this problem was to use what they call attention. And with this attention, what they could actually obtain is that even for very long sentences, the score was kept um, high even after 30, 40, 50 words. So let's first remind us what is the basic structure of an RNN, as we saw in the I2DL lecture, and what kind of problems does it present, and what kind of problems does attention try to solve. So in a recurrent neural network, what we want to do is we want to have this notion of time or this notion of sequence. So we want to actually process every element that we have in the input, in this case xt, with the same operation and just process the element t with, for example, this small neural network, which we would call a, and predict an output. For example, we have as input an English word and as output the translation in German. And we actually know that our input has this sequential notion. So after one word comes another, comes another. And the order is actually important. And this is what we actually capture by essentially performing this, uh, this operation of processing the input with the same neural network, with the same learning block A for all the time steps in a recurrent fashion. So essentially, um, how this can be represented is with um, our input xt, which is processed alongside with the previous hidden state of our recurrent neural network. So we're processing both the current time step as well as everything that we did in the past until the time step t. And essentially, we're going to process this with two parameters, with two learnable weights that we're going to backpropagate, and of course, we're going to learn. And what this actually gives us is a new hidden state AT. Now, again, here, the important thing is that for each time step, we're going to actually use the same parameters to perform our update steps. So essentially, the parameters that I used to treat my input, that I used to treat my previous hidden state, and that I used to create my output are going to be exactly the same for each time step. And this is important, of course, for generalization, right? This is the basic structure of a recurrent neural network. So everything becomes a bit more clear when we actually unroll our recurrent neural network, where we can see actually the sequential nature, nature of the processing. So here we can see how we start with the first word of the sentence, which is our first input at x0, 
we process it through our neural network, and then we produce an output. We produce, for example, a translation. And this translation, whatever processing we did for the input zero, is going to have an impact on how we actually process time step one. And both are going to have an impact on how we process time step two, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera all the way towards the end of the sentence. So again, important thing, the hidden state is exactly the same for each of the time steps. So this is how we achieve actually generalization. But what is the problem of recurrent neural networks? The first problem is that when we're actually trying to process the output for time step two, we have to look at several variables, right? We have to look first of all at what was the input at time step two, but also what was the input at time step one. And what was the input at time step zero? So for time step two, this is still manageable. For time step t, where t is 100, I have to look at far too many variables to actually decide what word to output as a translation. So essentially, neural networks, recurrent neural networks, have the well-known problem of long-term dependencies. So when you're, for example, translating a sentence, and you see at the beginning of the sentence, I moved to Germany, then you explain several things, and after a couple of sentences, you end by saying, so I speak a certain word fluently. If you actually have to decide what this word is, what this language is, you of course have to go to the beginning of the sentence. So if I had moved to France, it is most likely that what I'm actually saying is that I speak French fluently. If I move to Germany, then it is most likely that I say that I speak German fluently. So there is a very strong dependency in this case between the word at t plus one and the word all the way up to the beginning of the sentence at time step zero or at time step one. So in order to solve this, what researchers have proposed is how about we use attention? And attention in this case, what it means is you're going to decide which hidden states, which time steps are more important to actually predict my output. And so, for example, in this case, what you want to generate is you want to generate some sort of context variable. And this context variable will actually process the different time steps in a different way with different weights. So for example, in this case, what you're actually aggregating in this context is the importance of the input at time step t plus one when you want to predict the output at time step t plus one. And in a similar fashion, you can encode with another weight, with another alpha, with another attention variable, the importance of time step t when you're trying to predict the output at time step t plus one. And you can do the same for all the time steps in your recurrent neural network. So essentially what you're evaluating is how important are all these different words, are all these different hidden states to actually predict my current output. And so the architecture for um, actually using attention for using attention, for example, for machine translation, would, in, would be an encoder-decoder type of architecture. So the decoder would actually process the information to create, for example, the translated sentence. And it would take, of course, the previous decoder hidden state. So we still have this idea of a recurrent neural network. It would take also the previous output because, of course, if you want to create a sentence that makes sense, you have to see what is the word that you said before. And it would also take the information of the encoder. And the encoder now has been, uh, is represented by our letter A, right? This is a small neural network that processes our input. But instead of passing directly the hidden state of the encoder to the decoder, we actually pass it through a series of attention weights. So you're actually going to measure the importance of the different hidden states, the importance of the different time steps. 
And so again, in this case, alpha 1, comma, t plus 1 would indicate how much the word in position 1 is important to translate the word in position t plus 1. And again, this connection is direct, right? You don't need to go through all the steps of the recurrent network, but there is actually a direct connection between step 1 and step t plus 1. And this allows you to kind of bypass the memory loss of the recurrent steps and directly say, if that word was very, very important, then really take a look at that hidden state. So this context variable, then what it does is it aggregates all this attention information, right? It takes the, uh, first of all, the attention variables, these alphas, but it also takes the hidden states. So in our case, the hidden state of the encoder was represented by A. So here we have um, all the A's, which are actually these embeddings, which are actually these encodings for, um, for the input sentence. So essentially what we're doing is a weighted sum of embeddings. And this is what is called soft attention because all of these attention masks actually sum up to one. So now the question is, how do we actually compute this attention mass? How do we actually compute these alpha values? Well, it turns out, of course, that we can train a small neural network to do the job. So in our case, if we want to predict the alpha value between the first word and the output t plus one, what we do is we create this small neural network and we feed the hidden state of the encoder at time step one, right? So this is the encoder, the, the hidden state of uh, the encoder at the first time step. So after it has processed this input, this first word, and the previous state of the decoder at time t. So essentially this is, I want to check what is the relationship between the input in the first place and the output that I want to generate at t plus 1. So I actually look at the input at time 1, and I look at my previous output to see if what do I have um, to output at t plus 1. So in both of these, I can actually train my neural network to output this value f, which we're then going to just simply normalize in order to obtain the alpha value. So it is important that all these alpha values actually sum up to one in the case of soft attention. And so for example, let's look at uh, one very famous model for machine translation, which is the sec to sec. And essentially what this model proposes is first of all, to use attention. But second of all, it is important to first read the whole sentence in one language. And afterwards, once you have processed all the sentence, then you start translating the sentence in the other language. So this is kind of one of the, of the things that is proposed in sec to sec not to actually translate word by word as the word in language one comes in, we output the word in language two. Better to first read the whole sentence in language one and then translate the whole sentence in language two. And in this case, attention is going to have a very important role. So this is uh, how the architecture can be depicted, right? First, we have this encoder, this meaning of reading sentence in language one. Then you have this information, which is essentially an embedding that is passed to the decoder, which actually starts translating the whole sentence in language two. So now the question is, okay, in this architecture, can I actually use attention? Of course, if the sentence is very long, we will have forgotten what was said at the beginning of the sentence, especially because we are processing the full sentence in language one before we start translating. So here, attention has actually a bigger role to play. So the role of attention is actually to take notes of the keywords as we read the sentence in the first language. And these keywords are going to be marked by really large attention weights. So how, how does this actually work in practice? So you have your encoder, which is actually processing the full sentence. 
And at each time step, you actually output an encoder hidden state, which is represented here in green. And you also have the decoder hidden state, which is represented in red. And so let's see how can we place this attention layer in between the encoder and the decoder. So essentially what is going to happen is first you're going to have to establish a score. And a score actually represents a relationship between the encoder hidden state at one time step and the decoder hidden state. Now, here we have depicted the scores for all possible encoder hidden states at the different time steps with respect to the decoder hidden state at this time step, let's say time step one here. So this is the relationship between the output at time step one and the input process at the different time steps. And what this gives us is actually an attention value, an attention mask. So we perform the normalization and then what we do is we multiply the encoder hidden state by this score. So essentially we weight the encoder hidden state depending on its importance and its importance is given by the attention score which is depicted in blue. So once this has been done we create the context vector and this is what we can actually feed into our decoder alongside with the, with the previous output of the decoder in the previous time step in order to predict the current output. So once we have seen the set to set, once we have seen the attention, we still have this feeling that the recurrent architecture is posing somehow a problem. So the, the memory problems of recurrent neural networks have not fully disappeared, so attention made things better. But the question here is, what if actually I can get rid of the recurrent architecture? So what if I don't have any recurrent neural networks, any convolutional neural networks, I just use attention for the task of machine translation? And it turns out that by just using attention, you can reach state-of-the-art in natural language processing and this fully attention-based model is actually called a transformer. So I'm just going to present briefly the intuition behind transformers um, and especially I'm going to put a special attention into the relationship with graph neural networks, which is what we wanted to do from the beginning. So essentially transformers change the notion um, that we actually need to use recurrent neural networks for machine translation, next word prediction, or any natural language processing related tasks. And so instead of processing the sentence word by word in a recurrent fashion, which is how we actually depict processing here at the top, what they propose to do is they propose to use a uh, transformer architecture, which essentially means that every word is connected to every word through an attention mechanism. And essentially what this means is that all the words can be connected to all the words, doesn't matter how far away in the past they are, and you're not going to have this memory problem of recurrent neural networks because you're going to have a direct connection between the first word and the last word. So this is essentially the, the notion, the basic notion, the basic intuition behind transformers. But wait a second, this, this actually reminds you of something, right? So if you now consider that your words are the nodes in a graph neural network, and these connections represent these attention values, then essentially you have a graph neural network. So you have represented the transformer as a graph neural network. And so broadly speaking, we can say that transformers are based on graph attention networks. So essentially, this is a graph neural network where we replace this aggregation operation, this, this notion of all neighboring nodes communicating with a node, which in classic graph neural networks was, for example, a summation. We replace this operation by a weighted sum, which is essentially an attention mechanism. So, of course, there are a lot of details that we will not explain in this lecture about transformers. 
But I want to get this notion through that attention mechanisms and transformers are actually not so different from the concepts that we have been seeing in graph neural networks. And so I would actually recommend you to read the original paper called Attention is All You Need to actually get uh, more of a deeper feeling of how transformers actually work. When we're actually looking at images, uh, we face a question of why do we actually need attention? So for machine translation, it was pretty clear. Different words have different impact to the translation. And it turns out that maybe a word that was said in one language at the beginning is placed at the end of the second language. So attention is perfect for that purpose. But for the purpose of, for example, image classification, why do we actually need attention? Well, it turns out that if we want to, for example, classify this image, and we want to classify with the label bird, we will pass the full image through a CNN. We will then pass it through a fully connected layer that will give us the last label, the label bird. But not all of the image represents the bird. So some of the pixels are completely useless for this classification of the class bird. In particular, the pixels around the actual object are the important ones, and the rest are completely interchangeable. So if the bird is flying over an ocean, is flying over grass, or is flying over a building, we don't really care. We're always going to classify it as bird. So this is essentially why we can use attention. In the image before, we had few pixels that were not depicting the bird. But in this image, there is a lot of information in the image that is completely useless for our classification task. And so we would really like to focus on the part of the image that is actually important for our task. We would actually like to put all the computational effort into this part of the image where the bird is depicted. So now that we know what attention is, we can go back to our original problem, semantic segmentation. So now, essentially, what we want our attention model to do is to put different weights on different objects at different scales. So essentially, you want to look at the image with different attention scores in order to process it properly. And in this case, what this CPR 2016 paper does is it proposes to use attention to look at the right part of the image at each different scale of the neural network. So I have a neural network that is working at different scales. And for example, when we're looking at scale 0 0.5, we're looking at the close by objects, right? So at a smaller scale, we can deal with bigger objects that fill a larger part of the image. And in this case, we have that this, um, this kid at the front of the image is actually the biggest object in the image. And therefore, what we would like our attention model to do is we would like to focus on this part when we're actually processing the image with a scale of 0 0.5. And in fact, the attention model gives you this area here in red and so tells the actual uh, neural network to put attention on this part of the image to compute the semantic map. Now, what happens when we're actually processing the image at a scale of one? So at a scale of one, we're looking, we're interested in looking at the smaller um, objects. So the object that at a scale of 0 0.5, we don't really have enough resolution to actually uh, semantically segment these objects. So at a scale of one, we're interested in looking at this object, which is far away, which is therefore really small. And in fact, the attention starts to pay attention starts to put emphasis in larger weights on this uh, far away part of the image. So essentially, uh, we're putting large weights on a small scale persons when we're dealing with an image at scale one, and large weights on large scale uh, persons or objects when we're dealing with the features coming from a scale of 0.5. And the nice idea here is the CompNet and the attentional model are going to be trained together. And now the question is, um, do we even need these separate blocks to actually take a look at the global information of the image, right? So we started from this uh, fully convolutional neural network, 
And we see that this is not powerful enough to get really these fine details in the contours, these nice segmentation masks. So we used the CRF on top of the FCN. We then used an RNN formulation that mimics the CRF in order to backpropagate all the way through the FCN. And finally, we use FCN with attention. But these are all kind of separate modules from the FCN. And one actually wonders, do we need this kind of separate, separate concepts, separate blocks, if we want to include the global information of the image? Well, it turns out not necessarily. And now you might be not, what, Laura, I mean, you're joking, right? I mean, we, we've gone through all of this lecture to introduce these concepts, and now you're saying that these are not really necessary to get a proper semantic segmentation. Now, the thing is that it is important to go through the steps that the researchers went through before reaching the final best solution. If I just present you the final best solution, well, this is not interesting, right? You didn't go through the whole research process. You might think, well, why didn't they do this or that? And this is because they learned something from their previous formulations. And this is why it is so important to actually present all of these formulations. So now we reach to the formulation of DBLAB version 3. So three versions later, DBLAB is much, much better. And what it proposes to do is not only to combine the dilated convolutions with the spatial pyramid polling, which were um, two of the important elements of the DBLAB architecture, but it also combines it together with an encoder-decoder module. Therefore, a type of unit or a type of autoencoder style of architecture. And essentially, there are certain elements that actually make this whole thing work. Right? So first of all, we're going to encode multi-scale contextual information. So information from essentially large receptive fields by applying dilated convolutions at multiple scales. So look here at all the convolutions that the encoder has, right? It has not only one by one convolutions, but also three by three convolutions at rate six, so really dilated convolutions, rate 12, rate 18, so really largely dilated convolutions. Then we have some pooling operations. All of this comes together to form our feature map. And then we have the decoder. So in the decoder, our goal is essentially to gather all of this information which comes from all kinds of levels, right? So we have high-level features, low-level features from all of these atrus convolutions. And we want now, what we want to do is we want to refine the segmentation results. We want to do what the CRF or the RNN or the attention did. We want to refine the segmentation results along the boundaries. So we get this output, right? These are, this is um, sort of a course map. So we have to upsample this course map, right? And what all of this is going to do is it's going to just refine the segmentation boundaries. Refine it with low level features, like look at these features that come directly from the backbone here. So these are really low level features. And the thing that actually makes this whole architecture work is actually the use of depth-wise separable convolutions. So let's see what those are. So depth-wise separate convolutions are uh, different convolutions um, with respect to the normal ones, essentially um, in the way that they actually deal with the depth channels. So in a normal convolution, you would have this input size, this block of 12 by 12 by 3, and you would apply a convolution, let's say a 5 by 5 convolution on top. Now, since you know that the depth of this block is actually 3, you know that your kernel is going to be 5 by 5 by 3. And then if you apply, for example, 256 of those convolutional filters, you get an output at 8 by 8 by 256. So this is a classic convolution. Now, a depth-wise separable convolution is something different. So it doesn't take the depth of the feature map as a block, but it actually tells you, no, I'm, I'm a filter, let's say I'm the orange uh, convolutional filter, and I'm just going to act on um, the first channel, the first depth channel. Now, the red filter is going to act only on the second channel, 
and the yellow filter is going to act on the third channel. So I'm going to have a different filter, different convolutional filter, which is going to be applied only at certain depth of my feature map. So essentially how you can implement this is by using what is called groups in PyTorch. So normal convolutions have group sets to one and convolutions used, for example, in this image would have group sets to three. Now, of course, what happens during this operation is that now um, I have not converted my 12 by 12 by three um, feature map into a representation which would be 8 by 8 by 1 if I used one filter. So now essentially I have used three filters, each of them is acting at a different depth and each of them is outputting one channel at one different depth. So essentially the depth, uh, the output at the first channel will be given by the orange filter, the output at the second channel will be given by the red filter, the output at the, red cha at the third channel will be given by the yellow filter. But now the question is, well, if I actually do this operation with depth-wise separable convolutions, the depth of the output is always the same as the depth of the input, right? And one nice thing that we had with convolutional layers was that if we applied, for example, 256 convolutional filters, then our output size in depth was 256. So we could kind of play around with the depth of our feature map. But now with their void separable convolutions, this is no longer possible. Well, it turns out that um, it is still possible to pair depth-wise separable convolutions that don't change the depth of the feature map with, of course, one-by-one -one convolutions that we know do change the depth of the feature map and we know exactly how to change the depth of the feature map. So now you might ask the question, well, why, why did we go through all this trouble, right? Why are you actually introduce, introducing depth-wise separable convolution? So what is the advantage of that? So let's take a look at the normal operation that we have with the normal convolution, right? So here we have this 12 by 12 by 3 feature map. We apply a kernel, which is 5 by 5 by 3, and we have an output of 8 by 8. Now, in order to have an output of 8 by 8 by 256, we would need to apply 256 kernels of size 5 by 5 by 3. Now, if you actually do the multiplications, 256 by 5 by 5 by 3, by all the locations in our output map, then we have, well, a lot of multiplications. Now, let's look at what happens when we separate this operation and we instead do a depth-wise convolution plus a one-by-one one convolution. So the first operation that we do only changes the spatial dimension. And it goes from a 12 by 12 by 3 representation into an 8 by 8 by 3 um, output map. So this is the operation that we see here with the depth-wise uh, separable convolutions. So this means that we apply three kernels of size 5 by 5 by 1. And therefore, the number of multiplications that we do in the depth-wise separable convolution is actually 5 by 5 by 3 by the number of locations in our output map. Right? This is straightforward. Now, once we have um, this output of 8 by 8 by 3, what we have to do is we have to convert it into an output of 8 by 8 by 256 in order to have the exact same output as we had here. So for this we can do, uh, what we can do is we can use one by one convolutions. So we can have 256 kernels of size one by one by three that act on top of our representation, which is eight by eight by three. And in order to convert this eight by eight by three feature map into an eight by eight by 256 map, we have to do this amount of operations. So look at actually how many multiplications did we actually avoid, so did we actually save, from simply changing from an original convolution to a depth-wise separable convolution plus a one-by-one one convolution on top. And essentially we have 
the same input of 12 by 12 by 3 and the same output of 8 by 8 by 256, but now with um, a lot less computations. And essentially, this allows us to, to apply this dilated convolution at all kinds of different scales um, while still keeping the number of computations manageable. And we can get really, really nice qualitative results for semantic segmentation. So this is still considered as um, state of the art actually for semantic segmentation, Deep Lab version 3 plus. So of course, um, we've been talking a lot in this lecture about Deep Lab. So Deep Lab is actually really good really delivers nice results, but there are other important architectures that I would actually recommend you to read on, um, especially RefineNet and PSPNet. So RefineNet is actually CPR 2017 architecture, and it's a fairly complex architecture with many building blocks, but the goal is essentially the same. So use convolutional layers and only convolutional layers to refine the information that is coming at different scales. And as far as PSPNet goes, um, it has a similar idea also to RefineNet. So this idea of fusing information from multiple scales, which is essential if you want to segment objects which are really large and objects which are really small. But in this case, the features are shared. And the multi-scaling actually comes from a pyramid pooling module. So the method is a bit simpler than RefineNet and it actually performs slightly better. So I would actually recommend you to read these two papers, uh, these two CPR papers, PSPNet and RefineNet. So we'll end the lecture by taking a brief look into the data sets and metrics that we can use for the problem of semantic segmentation. So, of course, in deep learning, we're very much interested in data sets, right? So, annotations where we can train our neural networks on. And so, in 2012, people were working on the Pascal Vogt data set for semantic segmentation, which contain around 10,000 images for uh, 20 semantic classes. But, of course, quickly as deep, la deep learning um, arrived into computer vision, Data sets also evolved and became larger and larger. So we have now cityscapes, which is actually 25,000 urban street images, so only for autonomous driving. Then we have AD20K, which essentially has 25,000 images for 150 classes. So here uh, augmented the number of classes. And also the mapillary vistas with a similar number of images. So it is worth noting that most of the models that you will find online are pre-trained on the very large MS Coco dataset and then fine-tuned on one of these datasets. So MS Coco is kind of the standard, uh, kind of the image net for semantic segmentation where all the networks are pre-trained on. And as far as metrics go, things are quite similar to detection. We also use the intersection over union metric. In this case, intersection over union is just easier to compute because, of course, we have pixel-wise correspondences, so we don't have to compute the intersection between bounding boxes, but now between segmentation masks. And essentially, the idea is the same as for detection, to divide the area of overlap by the area of the union. And um, the mean intersection over union is simply the intersection over union for each class and then the mean of all of those values. So very, very similar to the metrics that we used also for detection. And another widely used metric that is used is actually the pixel accuracy, which essentially represents the ratio of the pixels that are classified correctly. So this is all for the lecture on semantic segmentation. Thank you for your attention and stay tuned for the next lectures.